and welcoming you. And then we are going to welcome Susanne K. Petersen uh, and her, uh, her presentation about sustainable value chain management. And then we're going to, to end the webinar with an open discussion, which my partner from the Excel Living Project, Agusti, uh, is going to, to facilitate. And then we're going to end the webinar at, at two o'clock. And just shortly, so you understand where is this uh, training program coming for, from? Uh, the Excel Living Project focuses on uh, habitats, uh, but in a cross-sectorial dimension. So it's both within home automation, welfare technology, lighting, furniture, construction materials, etc. Uh, and one of the aims in this project is to offer an innovative program of webinars addressed to SMEs and to other cluster members as well. And this is to increase their competitiveness and internationalization opportunities and essentially to enhancing a smarter and more age friendly and greener habitat value chain and, and its sectors. So the training program will offer webinars within digitalization, advanced technologies, sustainability and internationalization. Uh, and just to inform you of where you can find these, this uh, re recording and the slides from the, from the webinar, you can find it on the Excel Living Help Desk afterwards. And I'm going to send you all the, the link for it afterwards. And also on the Excel Living Help Desk, you can network with other partners within the Habitat Value Chain. And of course, you can access all the training materials we have on the Help Desk. And you can ask questions to a team of advisors. And if you are interested in finding partners for collaboration, uh, you can also do that through the Exit Living Health Desk. So, of course, I will send you the link afterwards for this one. And now I'm going to, to welcome Susanne uh, from Eversus Hovedstaden, and she's a senior business developer. And she is going to. And now I'm going to, to welcome Susanne. Uh, from Eversus Hovedstaden, and she's a senior business developer, and she's going to tell you about sustainable value chains. So welcome, Susanne. Tak. Hi, everybody. I'm looking forward to entertaining you. I will be sharing a presentation, and uh, I will start by excusing if it's a very, very quick run through a kind of complicated subject. Uh, but I hope that you will forgive me and that you will be with me in uh, in trying to work with this. Um, it's a it's a method. It's called the six steps that I'm going to take you through, and maybe most of you know it already. It's uh, from it's from the OECD uh, recommendations on how to have a responsible business conduct. The first uh, you will get my slides afterwards. I'm sure, Nana. Uh, is already ready for sending them out, just so that you know that you can take contact afterwards if you have more questions. And a lot of the materials that I have that is behind this is in Danish. So I'm very sorry uh, for the rest of you, but for the Danish companies, I will be able to send you further detailed uh, information afterwards if you reach out to me. So it's a method uh, on how to make a sustainable business change or a business uh, chain. Um, it's actually it's a method on a process how to do it. So it's not that you are sustainable just by following it, but it's a way of handling your supply chain and working with it so that you will be able to provide information to your customers. And also it's a way of starting to change um, the way that you have your supply chain. I promised myself a long time ago that I would start every uh, lecture I give with this picture. So please forgive me, but I think it's really important because the supply chain due diligence framework is kind of, it's a very, it's a lot of paperwork. It is a lot about information that goes forward and back. But please keep in mind that there's a reason why we're doing it. Um, and that the real uh, issue that we have here is trying to change the way that we do things. So that should be the purpose of starting it. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, so um, it's a it's a method. It's called the six steps that I'm going to take you through, and maybe most of you know it already. It's uh, from it's from the OECD uh, recommendations on how to have a responsible business conduct. The first, uh, you will get my slides afterwards. I'm sure Nana. Uh, is already ready for sending them out, just so that you know that you can take contact afterwards if you have more questions. 
And a lot of the materials that I have that is behind this is in Danish. So I'm very sorry uh, for the rest of you, but for the Danish companies, I will be able to send you further detailed uh, information afterwards if you reach out to me. So it's a method uh, on how to make a sustainable business change or a business uh, chain. Um, it's actually it's a method on a process how to do it. So it's not that you are sustainable just by following it, but it's a way of handling your supply chain and working with it so that you will be able to provide information to your customers. And also it's a way of starting to change um, the way that you have your supply chain. I promised myself a long time ago that I would start every uh, lecture I give with this picture. So please forgive me, but I think it's really important because the supply chain due diligence framework is kind of, it's a very, it's a lot of paperwork. It is a lot about information that goes forward and back. But please keep in mind that there's a reason why we're doing it um, and that the real uh, issue that we have here is trying to change the way that we do things. So that should be the purpose of starting it. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, so why should you do it? And how do you start doing it? It's on everybody's lips. And I think it's because the CSRD, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Otherwise, there are a lot of webinars streaming about that. A part of the CSRD legislation demands that the bigger companies have to start caring about how their value chain or their supply chain is behaving. And so I see a lot of companies that start getting all these uh, questionnaires. For some of the companies here, you are big enough that you will be put under this legislation that comes from the EU. And so your companies in your own right will be met by legal demands that you have to start accounting for your impact on the world in a sustainable perspective. Uh, and also the way that you are handling your supply chain. So that's one of the reasons why you should start doing it. Of course, if you want to keep on being the preferred supplier to the customers that you have, you have to take an interest what's their agenda. Um, so what kind of sustainability issues will you be meeting in your sales work? And that could also inform your company in the middle on how to approach this uh, supply chain work that you will be starting. And least but not the uh, last but not least, of course, it's because we want a better planet for everybody. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick run through of these six steps of due diligence. And as I said, it's based on the OECD, but uh, as I read the OECD material, it's really complicated. So what we have here is a kind of a translation that makes it a lot more accessible for smaller companies to um, to address. And I forgot, Nana asked me to remember to tell you, so now I'm doing it. Uh, if you have questions along the way, please write them in the chat. Nana will be looking at the chat. So you can you can ask questions along the way. Like I only have 40 minutes, so I think it's we cannot go into discussions. But if you have clarification questions, please do uh, make them uh, make them known. And then, and then Nana, she will beat me uh, so that we take them on the way. Um, but the six steps, it's quite it's like doing a project. Actually, you start one place and then you can do them all over and you make an evaluation and you start all over. So what you will start by doing in this method to get your due diligence in place is that you have to start making your policies and your management systems and make it known that you are committed to doing this. There are different ways of doing it. I'll get back to that. The next thing that you will be doing is a risk assessment. Where in your value chain will you have issues that you need to address? How serious are they? Uh, and there's a method for doing that, which I will be introducing. And the main part of this little lecture is put here because this is a way to get you started and there's a quite clear framework on how to do it. And then, of course, it's dealing with the issues. I'm not going to go so much into that, but there are some uh, there are some handles that you have that you can use that we try to to give you. And then number four, if we jump to the other side of the page, is the tracking and follow up system, because this is an ongoing process. Uh, the demands will be tightened and you will need to be following up on what's going on. Then you will have to communicate it. It's, it's an inlaid part of the process. 
And then I will not be going into the remediation and complaint mechanism. It's mainly relevant for quite big companies. Uh, so I'll just mention it when we get there, but this I will not be giving very much attention. So it's a super short introduction, but first I would want to make the disclaimer. Uh, no, I see it. There you are. Okay. So just to make the disclaimer, is this going to protect you from greenwashing if you work with this project? What you get from this process with the six steps, this overview, its ability to prioritize, its risk management, nothing happens that you're suddenly unaware of and need to deal with. You will be upfront. You will be able to collect the data that your customers will need or you will need for your reporting. And it gives you quite a good solid foundation for the communication. In best of all cases and the way that you approach it, you approve your supplier conditions and you improve your supplier relations, which can be really important for the business part also. And you assist in the way of getting a more responsible supply chain throughout, uh, throughout the chain. And I think I'm not sure on how it is for the other uh, nationalities attending this uh, lecture, but in Denmark, I think that 95% of our climate impact stems from the value chain. So the companies themselves only have the 5%. So in that sense, it's really important that we get the whole way through it. But what you cannot say is that working with due diligence is a green card to claiming sustainability because it is a description process, it's a working process, it's a relationship process. So it's not a certification or anything like that that gives you the right. So just to make that very clear. And now to the steps. So uh, in order to make a change, you need to have a vision. Maybe uh, the companies uh, here, they already have a sustainability strategy. That would be perfect. But if you don't have that, how will you get started in working with your supply chain? You need to make clear what's your commitment, what's OK and what's not OK in your conditions. And I meet a lot of companies that ask, how do I know what to include? How do I know what to exclude? And I think that there are different starting points on where to collect knowledge on the focus that you should have when you start doing the due diligence. Uh, I'm very much fond of the Global Compact reporting system. And I think that the new framework that they have made, where you get all these uh, solid data questions that you need to answer, is a really, really good place to seek information on what's of interest in the sustainability package. Because the Global Compact uh, data uh, pack is very much like the CSRD and the taxonomy questions. So you will be covering a broad area of aspects that will be of interest to the reporting or that will be of interest to customers that will need to do the CSRD reporting. So that's a very nice place to find inspiration and check is this relevant for my company or not. Of course, if you're not working with chemicals, you jump that question, but it's a good overall list that you can take from. And then for all my companies, I always, I have forgotten to introduce, I work as a senior business developer. And what I do in my everyday life is that I work with companies on how to approach the green transition and the sustainable transition. So I'm, I do this every day with companies that have to start somewhere and then increase the sustainability work that they have. And when 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 you are starting working with your supply chain, it's a really good departure point to call your five biggest customers or the most important that you have, or maybe 10, um, but at just three to five and see what's their agenda, what's, uh, what's going to be their demands, what is important for them, how do you assist them in being able to fulfill their sustainability goals, because the questions that they will be asking you in their supply chain work or in their due diligence work will be the questions that are important for them, of course. So in that way, you can prepare yourself to see, OK, any of the questions that will come to me from my customer, are there any way in my own supply chain that I have to push these questions further on to see if the promise that I have to make is actually fulfilled throughout my supply chain. So for these three, I think 
if you if you take that departure point, you are really well off. And it's a big packet. So maybe if you just start with asking your customers, you are on the start. Um, but otherwise, I would say you couldn't go wrong if you have done this. And then you make your commitment. And these commitments, they look differently because some very advanced uh, companies, they already have sustainability strategies. They have goals and visions and promises. And that is super cool. But if you have not already made a full strategy and you are not prepared for doing that, you can start by making code of conduct or, or specific policies. Maybe you have a specific policy on chemicals. Maybe you have a specific policy on forest use, maybe you have a specific policy on employment treatment, whatever is really important for you in your company. And maybe you can integrate it in your code of conduct, which is also a document I have seen in different editions. Some are very much just for the suppliers. Some code of conducts include how the company behaves themselves. But if you Google a code of conduct, you will have it in a thousand different examples on the internet. And it's a super good departure point. I always look to what are the competitors doing so you get something that is within your sector, which is really nice. So that's one of the places that you translate your policies and a code of conduct, a policy, a strategy that can be put on your website and can be reported if you are under the global compact. But then you are somehow you have a stable foundation so it gets really clear also to your supply chain what is it that they have to live up to in order to be able to be your supplier just looking at the clock ah that's super fine um so uh, in the danish context we've been working some with this uh, for a while so i have some different checklists i have a, a super small scale commitment uh, paper um, and I have a different examples of code of conducts, but they are really available in all kinds of languages. And there are different places that you can find it. So the commitment is some way it's the most difficult thing because this is where you take a stand. And this, this is the place that you make the promises that you will have to communicate and live up to. Uh, a part of step one is actually also how you anchor it in your organization, because it's really difficult for one person that sits, maybe you are 100 people in a company, and there sits one person responsible for a part of the value chain, shopping some kind of stuff, or maybe it's the sustainability responsible person. But you need to make sure that you have your leadership on board and you need to identify the important persons in your organizations that will take this further on. And this is, of course, also an ongoing work. But if you don't get your leadership aboard from the beginning, it's going to be a really hard work because all this material somehow have to be integrated in the company's overall strategy uh, by the end of the day in order to be fulfilled, because none of this is free. It takes time. And when you start working it, sometimes it also takes resources. Yeah, so now ta -da, you have your policy in place. You can go home and do it. Uh, and I wish that I could see you because then I could check out how many of you already have it. But uh, in that sense, I miss the good old day workshop days. Now you are blank paper for me, so I just have to jump to number two. So when you have your policy, you have to start making in your supply chain risk assessment. And this uh, is a process where you look through it. You, you look through what's important for me and my company. And then throughout my value chain, where is it that my suppliers maybe have a risk of violating my no can do's or my I really don't like can do's. Um, and a really good way of starting it uh, is actually just drawing up the, the value chain line. Uh, and of course, there are different responsibilities on how far you go back, but start by drawing it all the way if you don't have it already. How are you connected into delivering on the promise or the service or the product that you are delivering? Who is involved on the way? Uh, and I have I have tried to find different, uh, what do you call that, models for drawing up a value chain on the internet. And actually, I found that to be very difficult. So in that sense, we are a little bit on our own, but this is a representation on what is going on on the way. 
And for some sectors, it gets really complicated because maybe there is an auction on the way. I know with diamonds and coffee and stuff like that, it can get really complicated tracking behind the auction. And then what do you do? But at least when you drop your value line or your value chain, you get an image on where who are involved in the process or service say, or the product that I am producing. The due diligence method actually includes the downstream. And in that sense, you have to take just a consideration on what happens to my product after end use and what happens to affect the communities after end use. I think there was a big case about Coca-Cola that was trying to do this sugar campaign, which is a little bit contradictive. And in that sense, you have to also consider what is happening to people that use my product. But in order to make it tangible, we have started with just working with your supply chain. You can put the other end on afterwards. It's just to get a method up going. Um, and then you start by identifying the general risks. And general risks are a broad spectrum of different things. It can be country specific. It can be sector specific. You can seek information in NGOs or in sector unions with your embassies or unions, the trade, the trade unions, to get information on, okay, so if I'm buying this material in this country, in this setting, in this size of company, is there anything in particular that I should be aware of? This is a desktop work and it's a calling work. Uh, and there are different places that you can seek inspiration. Uh, the MVO risk checker, which is uh, the first one, is for free. So that's a super tool. Aetis Cattle is for the Danish uh, companies. That's all in Danish. There are different uh, guidelines. So you can, I took the Preferred by Nature NGO just as an example of where they give information. And on the biodiversity, uh, uh, there's uh, a new risk folder that you can use also, uh, which is also for free. Um, uh, and that is, of course, important if you work with stuff that has uh, extra impact on the biodiversity. So then you get some general risks. And then we have got this, uh, it's just a little, uh, a little scheme. Uh, where should you be aware? And I think these are the same subjects that you will find in the Global Compact or that you will find in the CSRD questions that the, that the bigger companies have to be reporting on. But it's just to give you an example of what is it that I'm looking for uh, in the three different uh, areas that we are reporting in. Um, and some of it will be more important than other to each of your companies. Uh, of course, what is really important is that you start a dialogue with your suppliers. Um, and I went to do an interview with a small company in southern Jutland uh, a couple of weeks ago. They are 10 people. They work in metal. Uh, so it's it's just one director and she has 10 people uh, hired. So it's a small company. And she'd been met with this really big uh, questionnaire with a lot of questions. And she was like, oh, my God, I'm everything at the same time. I'm not even sure I understand what it says. Uh, so I would really recommend if it's the first time that you start this kind of dialogue with the, your suppliers, don't send them anything without calling because it's really important for you to maintain a good dialogue and maintain a good relationship. Uh, and for some suppliers, this can be really, really difficult to handle because they're not used to it and they're not used to the language. They don't know what some of these categories actually mean. And a lot of them are behaving super responsibly. It's just not written down or put into a language. In your dialogue, especially in some geographies, you have to be very careful on what people are answering. Are their answers trustworthy? Uh, do they use third part audits? Uh, can you look at the other customers that they have? If you're shopping in a Chinese factory, who else is buying in? Can you see if they are doing the diligence? What kind of other security uh, meshes can you find that they will be behaving good? Or can you contemplate your own uh, audits? I know for some, this can be a much bigger expense than for other companies. But it's a good idea starting with the questionnaire also. And to use a questionnaire as opposed to just have a chat, which is, of course, the most relationship-friendly way of doing it, is that the questionnaire will enable you with 
uh, doing statistics later, you can do a follow up uh, across different vendors or different suppliers. So you get a comparative uh, foundation. And then I know it's uh, on Danish, uh, but it says questionnaire to our collaborators. Um, uh, so it, it is just a risk questionnaire that we have in Danish. And the way that you can map it while you do it is that you, uh, this is just an Excel. And I see there's a lot of different digital tools popping up. Uh, so if you, I don't know if you use uh, digital uh, audit uh, systems already, but we see that, uh, especially with the CO2, more and more systems are coming that can automate, uh, generate uh, some of the data. And also on the due diligence data, some of these questionnaires already exist in the systems. So you can always consider if you want to, I mean, if you want to really dive into this, and, and this is going to be a big part of the way that your company work with your suppliers, at a certain point, it will definitely save a lot of time to go into the digital world. But this is just Excel, which I'm super fan of because you can make it yourself and you can filter and everything is really good. And this is a really easy way of getting started. And it's just an example that you can adjust to your own use, but you describe your risk where you find it in your value chain. You describe the cause, who is doing it, who in your value chain. What kind of category are you in? And here we've just uh, divided it into three categories, the social and the climate and the governance category. And then there's a way of assessing how important is it that I take care of this? Um, uh, the severity is the graveness of the violation. So the health risk is really bad if it's chemicals that will flow over. Uh, the scale means uh, how much will it affect if it happens. So the health risk, if it's an atomic bomb, is super scale. If it's a uh, glue that you take out of your children's uh, glue thing, it's not so big. It's one person at a time. So the scale is about how many people or what, what uh, mass in our nature will be affected if this happens. Uh, can you remediate it? So do you have an opportunity of uh, making the damage good again? And then you accumulate uh, your collected risk. And then in the end, there is a probability of is this going to happen? And of course, these are just numbers, but it gives you a way of when you have maybe you would identify 10 risks in five different suppliers, maybe you identify 80 in 40 different suppliers, but it gives you an overview from, and, th and that's a departure point for you to start working with, what am I going to address? And, and I don't know, I've always felt that with these number schemes that sometimes you have a feeling that even though this doesn't get a high number, this is something I need to address anyway. So it's not that the truth will come out of it, but it gives you a guideline. And, and this is a really easy way of just to get an overview. So that's your desktop work. When you start doing your risk assessment, of course, you look back to your policies because a risk that is a total no-do in your uh, sustainability strategy or a risk that is specifically mentioned in your code of conduct as something that you will not tolerate, of course, will have to be prioritized over subjects that you have chosen not to address in your own strategy right now. So it's also a way of discussing with the people involved, uh, as I talked about, maybe the leadership, different persons, it could be the quality manager, the, the supply chain manager, maybe the sales manager. So who needs to be on the table doing this kind of risk assessment? That's a very good uh, considerations to have. I'm just uh, looking into my notes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And a really important part of doing this work is to always remember I don't have to do it all straight away. Um, so, so one of the reasons why you will be prioritizing it is that everybody does respect. You cannot fix everything at the same time tomorrow. So it enables you to do a plan and maybe you can always, if you have 
They, one of the cases that I have seen was the Danish company called Linak, and they have 400 suppliers. And of course, for them, it's totally impossible to start working with 400 suppliers at the same time. So they had chosen 10 for a pilot and then 30 for the next round and 30 for the next round. And in that sense, they are working through it one step at a time, starting with the suppliers that are most business critical for them in order to make sure that they address what they think is business critical and also, of course, environmentally critical at the beginning. Um, look at the timing. OK, I have 10 minutes, 15 minutes left. Yeah. Uh, let's see, let me change it. There you are. OK, so the recap for the risk assessment. You need to map your supply chain. That's the departure point. Otherwise, you don't know what you have in your hands. Then you start uncovering risks. And there were the different places that you could take your departure point. What kind of risks am I looking for? Uh, what is important for my customers? And where do I think in my value chain, also taking into account the geography, the sector and the specific uh, suppliers, where do I need to be extra attentive? Um, and then you assess and prioritize. And during this, you also have a dialogue with your suppliers so that they know that this will be coming. So I hope this makes it clear how to do an assessment on the risks that you have. And hopefully using this Excel or a system that you already have, you will be able to see, OK, so this is serious. We need to do this now. This is not so serious. We can address that uh, by the time coming. Yeah, so and then this is the, the uh, this is actually the difficult part because the risk is this word, right? So now you need to start thinking about how do I change the world? This is also the really beautiful part of it. Uh, in order to know what to address, you should just keep in mind that different things will be expected of you, also according to how close you are to, to the negative impact that is created somewhere. Um, and the OECD framework splits it up into three different parts, and I think it actually makes sense because you can cause it by if you own a factory in India, and that puts chemicals in the river and you're the owner, this is your direct responsibility. You are causing it. So you will be expected to take action on that right now. So that's a lot for subsidiaries. Here you have the full control. This can also happen in your own country or, or neighbor countries or, or with local suppliers. Um, but, or you can contribute. Here you are in the supplier, uh, in the supplier part, because here, there is something in the way that you are trading, dealing, asking for, for the, your suppliers to act that somehow causes some kind of negative impact. So here you will also be expected to act. But of course, you do not own the entity that is actually causing the harm. So the way that you are responsible, it's a little bit further, but you will be expected to act anyway. And in the third, you are tied to it and maybe you address a risk, you can raise the risk, uh, but maybe you don't know the risk because the supplier has told you everything is fine and suddenly you find out, oh, it's not fine, they are having slaves, then they said they didn't, but you are not actually causing it. And here you can raise your leverage and see if you can work on it, but you will not be expected to fix it in any way. Of course, you yourself can always ask yourself, then do I want this supplier? But that's a different question. Um, and that leads me to the next, because when you are dealing with the impact that you are part of creating, uh, there are different intentions and strategies that lies behind it. And I think that this is one of the places where we also need to take in consideration that we come from different cultures and that different companies have different options and and, and different ways or different points of departure in this in the sustainability perspective. Um, and there are some questions here that I think that you should ask yourself what actually happens uh, if this is a scale where you 
change supplier, you get a new supplier, you're just saying that what you're doing is not okay, I want a new one. So you exit the old supplier and you get a new one that you have vetted and that you think is okay. So that's one strategy. That's quite harsh. Sometimes it can be necessary. Um, but of course, that has some impact also on what happens out in the supplier tire. Then you can set goals for the supplier. This I see a lot in Denmark right now. Uh, I've worked with several companies that have been met with customer demands for specific kind of certifications, specific kind of uh, climate accounting, specific kind of uh, chemicals they don't want, or, or um, and especially in the certification area. But then they work with a time frame. So it's like, we need you to get the certification in order for us to maintain our sustainability strategy. But I will ask you to have it within two years if it's a complex one. Uh, so that gives them time to start working and finding out how can I obtain this kind of certification. And it doesn't have to be uh, certifications. It can be all kinds of goals where you want their sustainability improved in order for your company to keep up with your sustainability strategy. Uh, and then there is uh, the contributing to change. I'm sorry, I have to do like this. Oh, I should sneeze. Oh, sorry. You okay? <laughs> I, I'm fine. I, I'm in a quite small studio in the uh. studio. Um, and the last one I think is really interesting and in, in, in the area where especially the larger companies should start taking more, um, more responsibility maybe, and we see it happening already with the really dedicated companies, is that they start working together with the suppliers on the changes they need to see. So in order to improve their own sustainability, they talk with their suppliers, it maybe it's just a few preferred ones, are there any investments, machinery, uh, training, impact? What can we do to help you on the way? And some have these opportunities and some companies does not have these uh, opportunities. But it's a super interesting way of connecting yourself with your supplier in a whole new method of working uh, that becomes long term. And, and one of the other really important issues in the moment, I'm sure, you all know that is the resilience in the supply chain with the with the difficulties that we have seen uh, through the last years. So it's a way of connecting yourself uh, to make sure that your supplier is doing well uh, for you to do well. So so we are not free until we are all free. Who said that? Um, but but what you can ask yourself is that how vulnerable are you in a connection to one supplier? Is it possible to source elsewhere? Because if you are very dependent on one kind of material that is not very available, you are more vulnerable. And that also is kind of deciding what you need to do in terms of a strategy towards a supplier. And also how easy is it for your supplier to change behavior? Is it actually not so much that takes, or is it a huge work, the time, time frame, uh, if it's possible at all, and, and also try to consider and talk with your supplier on what barriers will there be to change, uh, maybe if it's the way that they deal with the people that they have hired, uh, that can especially be if you work in China or other places where they have a different approach uh, to having people hired. So. So can you identify together with your supplier on your approach to this, if it's a supplier that you want to keep? How can you contribute? Do you have any leverage? Do you have any options or capabilities? And what happens when you start setting up demands? Uh, always consider if there's some kind of negative impact that could come of you actually wanting to do something good. And I think we are really in a place here where the dialogue will be deciding whether this will be a good process or not. So you start doing all this and then you can start making your plan. What should I do? And this is actually just a continuation of the old uh, Excel sc uh, schema I showed you a little while ago. So when you when you take, so you had the chemical risk, you had the supplier, uh, you had the severity of it, you had identified this is super severe, we want to do something about it. And then you start by making your plans on how to actually remedy it or prevent it or do something else with it. 
Do you see you have the responsibility? If you are directly tied to, it's not so bad. Uh, so maybe I should have made an example the way you're causing it. But what will you do with it? We want to prevent it to training. How can we use and increase our influence? Okay, we can make a code of conduct. We can make goals for them. We can thread them if we want. We can also assist if they want to do a training program because we're good at it. Who's responsible? Deadlines, status, status for follow up. And the, the latter is actually, that's just project management. So from here on, it goes to the project management and you start making budgets and time schemes and all that comes with that. But this is the due diligence. Uh, so, so in that sense, I think it's the identification of risk that is the new part, and then the actual decision on wanting to change something upstream in order to make sure that your own sustainability promise can be fulfilled. Um, a lot of it is really project work. What I see is that it takes time, it costs money, and you need to be careful not to start too many things at the same time. Uh, but it can really improve your, uh, your supply chain relationship when you start working together on it. For some supply chain relationships, it gets also complicated when you start sending out the, the questionnaires and they are not answering this uh, here also because they don't know what to do with it. And I think at the moment, it's it's somehow we need to acknowledge that what we put in the world, we need to take the responsibility for. You cannot expect the smaller companies to be upfront with answering some of the answers they will not have uh, or some of the questions they will not have answered to. A thing I hear a lot in a Danish context, and I'm sure it uh, goes for a lot of you, is that so especially when we have a global uh, sourcing or global supply chain, is that Okay, I'm using a lot of time, I think. No. Yes, yeah, Susanna, you have like uh, six, Four minutes. seven minutes left. Yeah, it's okay. Thank I you. can do that. Is there any questions that I should be addressing? Not at the moment. Ah, that's lovely. Then I can just talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one of the things I hear a lot is that how do I gain leverage? I'm in a global context. I'm just a small company. So what do I do? And these are some of the handles that you have. Work in alliances, seek others that have the same issues as you. See what you can do. Uh, lobbyism and politics are for the bigger companies, I think, but there are purchase in alliances, there are sector alliances. There are, in Denmark, we have the, the ethical trade alliance uh, that, that helps people go together and address an issue. It's a super interesting way of working. And then, of course, there's the dialogue. So if, when you look for possibilities and you think long term, it's a lot easier to change things. Um, and then there is a lot about how you actually purchase yourself. Um, so if you can forecast together with your important suppliers, I think I'm going to buy around these uh, quantities. They have a better a foundation for their planning, for their shopping, that can mean something for the prices, that can mean something for what they can shop and if they can do it in a more sustainable way. If you think long term and you make long term partnerships also going forward with your suppliers, maybe you enable them with the liquidity and, and the money flow that they can make changes that they wouldn't dare otherwise because they didn't have the security. And of course, you should assess your own fairness in your shopping. If you are asking for a lot at the latest moment and a long pay uh, push afterwards, then you are making it a lot more difficult for your supplier to act uh, responsibly. Um, so so you, should, you should really consider how you're doing it. You can reward improvements in either in your payment for... for um, for, for what you are purchasing, or you can reward it in the way that your trading agreements are put together. And maybe just simply ask for feedback, which is not really a, a procedure that very many companies have with their supplier because I'm the customer, so I should be the one. But, but, but uh, taking it the other way can sometimes make some things clearer where you can improve, uh, we can improve different aspects a lot easier because they tell you back what you are doing to prevent them from changing. And there's a super nice little 
English guide I put in the link uh, that you can use for that. Uh, yeah, so this is the recap. You decide your strategy, increase your leverage if it's possible, and then it's project work. Like we know it from every other change agenda. So the tracking and following up. Uh, I only have this slide on that, I think. And that's, I think, make an annual wheel. Uh, decide how much am I going to do it? Will I follow up on my uh, suppliers once a year, maybe? Uh, who's the responsible one? And this is actually just also, it's a project tool that you give yourself. Uh, this is just one way of doing it. But then you know, okay, I asked these questions the last time. I have a red flag on two of them. I need to check up. I will do this next May and then you come back and you see if any improvements have been made. Um, so in that sense, of course, everything takes time and you just need to make sure that you don't do it once and everything is forgotten, then you are the same place. Um, and with the communication, uh, it's just it's like what I said uh, in step one, in order for the due diligence process to be completed, you need to communicate what is happening. Uh, and a lot of these stories are super good press stories also, especially if you involve yourself in enhancing the sustainability in a supplier somewhere near you. Uh, so in that sense, it can enable different aspects uh, of your company. Uh, but part of it is being very transparent, and it's not that uh, it's yeah transparent. It's not that you should do all your questionnaires with your suppliers shouldn't be put on your website, of course. But but and somehow try to make sense for yourself what parts of this information should be public. Uh, the goals and visions, of course. Uh, what have you achieved? What did not happen? Um, so just make sure that you are saying it. I, and I'll just put down here uh, some suggestions on where you can use uh, the results that you get. So, so that's really uh, just basic communication. And then there is the remediation uh, mechanism. And I don't know if you are familiar with it already, but it's like a complaint mechanism. It's not the same as the whistleblower mechanism, but it looks a little bit like it. So you have a place where affected communities, persons, organizations, they can complain and they can feel assured that you will address the complaint uh, that they have made. And it's especially for the bigger companies with subsidiaries, but you can have that. And then we have, the, as you know it, in, the, in Europe, we have the national contact points where everybody can actually complain over something uh, to a, a public uh, point that will need to address what is happening. They cannot uh, give out fees. So in that sense, it's not legally binding, but they can outshame you if, um, if they feel that it's needed, which it's hopefully not. So that was the fastest run through the six steps that I have done so far. And I just put it down. I hope it made sense for you. So you make a policy, you will risk assess, you make an assessment. Do I violate in my supply chain my policies? How do I deal with it? It's project work. I track, I follow up. It's project work. Then you communicate and then you start all over because all your policies will be tighter and more sustainable over time uh, if we live in a utopia anyways. And then there is the complaint mechanism. So uh, that was actually it. I just kind of made it in time and then I will see if I can de-share my screen. Uh, there we are. Oops. Now I'm not sure where I have you. Yeah. You took Thank me you off. so much, Susanna. Thank you. I don't know. We have one, two minutes. If if anybody has a specific question for Susanna. Totally silent. Yeah, I guess that's because it was so clear and everybody understands now how to start working with due diligence and <laughs> sustainability. <I hope> so. <laughs> it's the first time I have been doing it in English. 
so uh, please uh, give feedback if anything was unclear, because then I can improve it for the next time. That would be super lovely. Uh, but you can do that now or to Nana or to myself anytime. Or if you need clarification, you just reach out. Then the email is in my slides. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susanna. At least I, I learned a lot, so I hope uh, any someone else also did that. <laughs> I can see Agusti is not nodding. He also learned a lot. Um, so yeah, now I'm going to introduce Agusti Patra.